It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and the MikeWagnerShow.com. Mike brings you great guests and interesting people from all across the globe. So sit back, relax, and enjoy another great episode of the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. You can check our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and Apple. Also on Deezer, Stitcher, and any form that you like to choose. Just Google the Mike Wagner Show and pick any podcast platform you'd like to listen to. Also take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. We're here with a feel-good act out of Long Beach, Michigan, originally from Iowa, and uh, he is best known in the healthcare industry and also in a spiritual sense, an uplifting and a finally positive soul heart act. Basically, it's just Inspiring stories from their own life, creates community, embarks, you know, about victory, loss, struggle, more as well, too. And this guy travels the country with nothing but the guitar and a trusty looper pedal. And, of course, he's a dance warrior, and he likes to build it up. So, live, ladies and gentlemen, from Long Beach, California, where, yeah, it does rain in Southern California. And, of course, you know, we got the good man who brings the great wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got Keith Rollins, best known as the Reverend Doctor. And hallelujah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us. The good Reverend Doctor. Bring us the good news. Absolutely. Oh, man, what's the good word, Mike? How you doing? Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> well, well, you're the good word, I have to say this. You know, looking at Reverend Doctor, it's like, you know, I mean, you've got the mess, and you've got the message, you've got the love, and, of course, um, you, you, you've you been doing this for um, quite some time as well, too. It's a musical project, um, which was born in the yes. Hartley of the United States, and it's about carrying a message of love, celebration, Far yes. and wide as their voices may reach. And you also have an interesting background as well, too. And before we get into all that, um, tell us how sure. you got started. Wow. Uh, started with music. I mean, you know, I was one of those kids just like everyone else that grew up in church, singing in the children's choir. The very first time I experienced performing music live, you know, I went to a small Christian high school in Iowa. I grew up in Ames, but I went to a small school outside of West Des Moines called Iowa Christian Academy for their chapel services. Um, They had just student musicians and they were asking about guitarists. My parents had bought a guitar, but I hadn't really touched it much. (laughs) And so (laughs) it was just singing these simple, like three chord, basically pop songs, you know, Jesus music. And that, that was like the first time I was, uh, like playing music with other people my first band wasn't until man i was like 19 and i met a dude that i knew in high school had played and he was like you want to be in a band with me and i said absolutely because i wasn't i wasn't going to school i i was i had a year off between high school and college and we were in this oh we were in this dave matthews style like (laughs) 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 this this you know pop fusion funk soul blues band and we were these kids in the middle of iowa thinking that you know oh my gosh we had i think seven or eight members when we started it was probably entirely too much to chew uh for a first band but oh my gosh it it was i will tell you that was the first time that i have experienced playing with other people being with other people in any context where you know there was just so much love and affection and and camaraderie and and brotherhood, Mm -hmm. I got really hooked on that. And I would say that that motivated me (laughs) all the way until today. 
you know, that feeling of being with people, of listening to other musicians. So that was re- that was really my first experience in a band was uh, 19. The, our, we were called the Troubadours. So uh, <laughs> if anyone <laughs> out there hears this and remembers the Troubadours, we played, we were a band for about four or five years, and uh, it was my first experience. I loved that band, and I loved the guys in it. I still occasionally keep in touch with them. I just spoke to our saxophonist the other day. But yeah, man, I I love it. It's it's been a, in my bones ever since, for sure. That is amazing. Sounds like you bring some good vibes. And who are some of your favorite <laughs> artists and um, singers growing up as well? Based on oh, your influences, up. yes, growing up. Absolutely. You know, the funny thing about this is that I grew up. My parents were kids of the '60s and '70s, so I grew up on this healthy diet of soul music. It was all Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder. Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know, Smokey Robinson, mm-hmm. the OJs. And, but it was also, I was the only black kid, you know, in my group of friends growing up. And so I also grew up on Metallica, on Bee Gees, on, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, oh yeah, uh, Gin Blossoms on, you know, that, that 90s pop mm-hmm. fusion of like rock and soul and you know, so Cody and the Blowfish, mm-hmm. uh, I, who I just got to see recently. Oh, so it, nice! It, this, oh, yeah, it was it was awesome. Um, but it's this amalgamation of these two sort of dichotomous worlds uh, that that I kind of grew up on. Because I I remember the first time a friend showed me, I called it white people music back then. It wasn't, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember the first time a friend for my like it was my seventh grade like he bought it for my birthday that year he bought me a gin blossoms album and i was like what is this what am i even going to be listening to here i don't even know they have all these guitars there's some of them are distorted i don't know if i'm going to like this and then i listened to it and the gin blossoms are just this is probably my first experience with thinking about music as crafting songs Mm -hmm. um like that album uh, I would have to say, uh, you know, listening to those songs, I realized that, A, it doesn't take much to write a song. And B, because it doesn't take much, it makes it really accessible and a beautiful thing to people. And that was the first time I was like, man, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. This is still really catchy music. And that was such a revelation for me. And then, that the, honestly, that one album that my friend giving me that being like, I dare you to not like this, was definitely <laughs> the gateway into all of these genres now. Because then I like, a really weird pivot i got into bluegrass in like early high school <laughs> and, oh my and, goodness uh, oh yeah and like bought myself uh in late high school a mandolin and learned how taught myself mandolin <laughs> really wanted to be in a bluegrass band i got into country i got into metal it, iowa has a huge metal scene mm-hmm. so if you want to see live music that's some of the only things to see so yeah i was I was influenced by all of these different directions. And so now, like, my musical background and palette is really wide. I mean, the, the bands that I played in everything from country bands to bluegrass bands to never a metal band. I don't think I, I quite have the steez for that. But I definitely, um, you know, all of that's a part of my musical DNA as and, far as what and, makes me up. So, and after yeah. talking to you, you will be in a metal band. I proclaim it in the name of Reverend Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's one of those things where I've, al- I've always listened to metal, uh, much to the chagrin of my, my wife. But I, it's one of those things where I, I've just always, and this is probably me just being unconfident, but, you know, being on stage. Because the thing about metal audiences is that they're actually really open-minded. Mm-hmm. If you love metal, then you're a part of the scene. And that's really the only criteria they have. Mm-hmm. Like, the the appearance, everything else, that is all secondary. If you're there, it's it's camaraderie. It's it's brotherhood. It's That's the thing that they love the most. And I, I will say, uh, like, you know, so it's probably me just being like, uh, wishy-washy, I don't I feel uncomfortable. But it, it's absolutely the kind of thing where I would probably, you, you're probably right. I should probably just go for it. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, recently I was listening to Queen's Reich and, um, you know, they're known for their um, lyrics as well, too. And Silent oh, yeah. City was based on, you know, Brahms' uh, lullaby and listen to it. And I said, you know, the way they write and everything else and a lot of these um, classic rock like Yes and e- 
Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. It's just, you know, just beautiful oh, yeah. lyrics, and it just reminded me, like, no wonder I was attracted to it. So I'm with you right there, too. Absolutely. And, um, and of course, if you do get into metal, let us know. We'd love to have you back on. And um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drop uh, just on SoundCloud uh, like a whole album of nothing but, you know, Reverend Dr. Metal songs just to throw people off one day. And I'm going to tag you, Mike. Just so you can hear it. Or 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 like, or, yeah. or, or he's called the man of steel. You know, that's another one too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm down with that. As many <laughs> monikers as I can have that are just completely unjustified, uh, I can tack on. I'm gonna let's do that. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay, we'll talk about your uh, latest album and your single. You listen to the Mike Wagner show at the Mike show.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all you need. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. You can check our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and Apple, Deezer, Stitcher, and more. Take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. And you can also... Google The Mike Wagner Show and pick any podcast platform and you can access The Mike Wagner Show on your Android, smartphone, Alexa, or your iPhone as well, too. We're here at Keith Rollins, best known as the Reverend Doctor, feeling good yes, about being yes. on The Mike Wagner Show. And, of course, he's got the medicine, he's got the cure, and he's also got the Dance Warrior album, which he can talk about, and also the single Build It Up. So let's talk about your uh, latest venture as well, too. And you can also um, do a little singing if you like Build It Up. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I mean, so with Reverend Doctor, it, I, I, this has been a project that I think has been incubating probably my whole life, growing up the way that I did. But with this most recent venture, with Build It Up, it's kind of, my ethos is interrupting the world's negativity with your own positivity. That's mm -hmm. sort of the message. But it was born out of personal, pretty dark personal experiences. I was in, I was living in Minneapolis. I lived less than two miles from where Philando Castile was shot. And um, I don't know if you remember a few years back that happening. Um, it, it, he's almost the same age as I am. We're almost the same height, same build. It was definitely one of those things that resonated with me because I remember feeling, you know, my wife and I were talking about having kids and thinking about, man, you know, after this, it, it was just a wake, a re-reminder, a wake-up call that, like, life is still different in certain places when you, you, you look a certain way. And so... If I'm being totally honest, that that thought had just eaten away at me, and it really made me angry thinking about have to have like having a child and thinking about my child and thinking about man, you know, this child I love would be brought into a world that just because the color of, this, of their skin would be treated differently, and rather than let and this was not a quick decision to come by. <laughs> I, I will admit this was a few months of just walking around angry. Rather than let that eat me up inside, I made the decision to instead take the negativity that the world was showing me and interrupt it with my own positivity. And that's not something that's like a victory lap. That's something that my parents taught me. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, my mom sat me down. This is a few, I think this was like a week before kindergarten. I remember this. She remembers this conversation. My mom sat me down, and, and she, before I was starting school, like I said, I was I was one of a few black kids in my grade in this town, and uh, I was we were you know one of the few black families in town as well in the middle of Iowa. And my mom said, "Keith, there are people in this world that are going to treat you different just because of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Don't ever let anyone treat you any different than they are. You are just." as good as they are. Mm -hmm. And that's a really heavy thing to tell a short person, you know, th that you love. And, but she, she wanted her words to be a shield to me. And so I 
remembered her words and I decided that I wasn't going to let that have victory over me. That the decision I was going to make was to build myself up, was to to remain in the love that my parents taught me and passed on to me, that is my legacy, and to spread that out to the community around me, to be a stalwart in the middle of that. And that doesn't make me special. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everyone, no matter who they are, there are as many people as there are on this planet, that's as many different ways to discriminate against someone. And we, we all take our turns and it can be small. It, it can be big. You know, all of our problems are big problems, but I mean, it could be because, you know, we've had privilege. It could be because, you know, we struggle with our mental health. It could be because, you know, our gender affects us in our workplace. All of these things, it doesn't matter. We have a decision to make whether or not we pass that negativity on or we interrupt that with our own positivity. And the reason I know that this is possible to, to interrupt and flip the script is because my mom said it of me. I am just as good. Mm -hmm. What my mom said about me is true for everyone. I'm not any different or any more special than anybody else. That's, that's the point. That's the beauty of it. And so with, with build it up, it was really kind of anthemic. I really wanted it to be this thing that definitely is my story, but is something that I could give to people across the country. And, you know, my message doesn't change. I say the same thing that I, in red states that I say in blue states. And I've never had anyone get angry at me. And the, the reason that is, I think, partially is because it's difficult to be angry at a story, mm -hmm. you know, the truth that you tell of your life. But I think another thing is that my point isn't about race, that race is a thing or racism is a thing. I'm not calling anyone out. What I'm telling people is that they have the ability to decide for themselves whether or not they will think that they are worth it. Mm -hmm. And what I'm asking them to do is to believe that they're worth it. Mm -hmm. So that's what Build It Up is. Uh, Dance Warrior is is basically, that's my newest single that I dropped two months ago. That is my personal uh, decision to choose joy over anything else. Uh, Dance Warrior is all about um it's, I think Maya Angelou said it best. She said, I know why the caged bird sings, is dancing in moments of, of heartache, in despair, in grief, is taking, once again, the, the terrible things that the world shows you. And for me, in my family growing up, dancing was always cathartic. You didn't dance just because you were happy or, I guess, in today's culture, uh, to, you know, find a partner out on the dance floor in the club. But... For, for me and my family, it was a way to celebrate, but it was also a way to mourn. But it was also a way to reflect our, the intention of your heart, you know, to say that this isn't going to get me down. I'm going to dance. I'm going to celebrate. And that's the message behind Dance Warrior. And mm -hmm. so I take all these songs and all these stories from all my experiences, and I try to fold those lessons into my songwriting, which as a pop songwriter is probably a tall order. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because I have, I have these messages that, you know, are definitely rooted in some pretty dark things. But ultimately, I hope the thing that people take away from, from my project, from my music, is this idea that, no, the world... The world can be an ugly, nasty place, but we can be that island. We can be that moment of peace in our life and other people's lives. We have, it's a decision and it doesn't have to be one that we base upon anything that the world shows to us. So like I said, as a pop songwriter, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably a tall order, but I don't know. I believe in the power of music. Mm -hmm. I believe in the emotional weight that music has mm -hmm. in its ability to change and transform people. So that is amazing too. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, ha have you sing as well too. And I'm so looking forward to it. Um, so here we go. Reverend doctor live on the Mike Absolutely. Wagner show. Go, go ahead and sing and uh, pick which one you want to sing about. Sure. Th uh, this is a song called pledge of allegiance. I sing about it a lot, but the message of it is simple. It's that I love America and I know that there's a lot of reasons that a lot of people have to be down on America, whether you are from here or you are not, or you are trying to come here. And so the message is simple. We have a sordid past. We have an uncertain future, but it is up to us what we make of it. Mm -hmm. So here it goes. 
I pledge my love to this, the United States of America. Land of my blood, she's all that I've known, and I wouldn't trade this home for another one. She's anything but perfect with her history of genocide and slavery. I still can't help but think that with all that we've been through, our best days could be ahead. It's still up to me and you. Oh. 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 We said in God we trust. So they called our bluff. And now we use their name in our religious game to hurt our neighbor instead of loving them. And love, love is so much easier said than done. When we're all out to get what we want, we forget to give love because it's easy for us, easy to take and so hard to give, hard to forgive, but that's what it takes. Hard to have faith, be faithful to our hearts, easy to give in, but I'll never give up. Oh, 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 I sing the truth of my people. I sing every word from my heart. I sing with love for my country. Unafraid, I give my heart. Give me love. Give your love. We give love. Give your love. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance by the Reverend yeah. Doctor here on the Mike Wagner Show. <laughs> and, and, of course, we'll talk about some other things. You also have a blog on a few subjects. We'll talk about that. You listen to the Mike Ooh, Wagner yeah. Show at the themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Looking for a professional website without breaking your budget? Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the Mike Wagner Show.com. You can check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also on Anchor FM, Radio Public, iTunes, Google Play, and Apple. Also on Stitcher, Deezer, and more. Take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on the YouTube channel. We're here with Keith Rollins, best known as the Reverend Doctor. Growing up yes, in sir. Iowa, now in Long Beach, California, and we talked about a little bit of his music, his background, and um, talking about um, Dance Warrior, Build It Up, and he just sang his version of the Pledge of Allegiance. And not only you also been promoting music and some goodwill, you also... You also have um, a blog as well, too, on ReverendDrMusic.com, and it's basically a blog. You've got Step Toward Loving Yourself, Midterms, Absolutely. Using Male Privilege and Power for Good. Welcome to the choir, and uh, tell us about some of the subjects you have on the blog. This is really good. Thanks, man. You know, I it's one of those things. I, I spend a lot of time, obviously, in spaces and, and having discussions about difficult topics and i have always been one of those people that presses into uncomfortable things i don't know why i've always had that kind of personality i'm the kind of person where if someone says something really awkward in public i investigate <laughs> <laughs> why do you think what that? why do you feel that way what what did you just say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I and i think the reason that is is because i'm fascinated by anything that's different than you know the, the conversations that we always have and because of that i i press into uncomfortable spaces and i also have i think a core personality need for people to get along I'm a middle child. I have two older sisters, two younger sisters. And I think 
uh, being a peacemaker is a part of my DNA and personality. And so for me, not just music, but really all of my talents and abilities, my mom, I think the quote my mom has for my life, and it's something that she says almost every time I see her, even still, is to whom much is given, much is required. I remember and, that, yes. Yeah, and I, I think what has always been on, in my heart and soul, because my mom has instilled it in me, is this idea that every ability that I have that I need to be using it for some purpose. It's certainly fun to to play around and entertain. And obviously, as a pop songwriter, that is the core goal with what I do. But as a writer, one of the things that I try to do is to invoke conversation and to press into those difficult topics. So I, I do talk about male privilege. I think I wrote that po post along when uh, Kavanaugh was being confirmed. And I'm, I've been thinking about my own privilege because growing up in a house full of sisters, I will say that my my privilege is one of those things that I'm only recently discovering looking back on my childhood, even in in my own home. And I have four very, you know, incredibly, I, I suppose the word is confident sisters who have achieved a lot in in the world. They're they're all scientists. They're all, you know, academically successful. And one of the things that I think that has always been on my brain has been, you know, seeking to understand and be an ally to women. But not only that, uh, I, I also write articles about, you know, blackness and and race, uh, gender, mental health. But yeah, like you said, that core, I suppose, message is of the self and loving the self and how to do that because I really think that that's the foundation that all of my messages are built on is is self is self love you know and for me it's not as simple as as saying hmm uh, you know here's just me promoting myself and the musical acts that I'm involved in or the products I want you to buy but it's also making sure that people somehow take something away for themselves and, and and enrich their own life and their way of being. That's that's I don't I feel like I'm probably becoming a bro broken record really quickly, but that's central and and a central piece of of what I try to leave people with. I'm, I'm thank you for mentioning the blog. <laughs> I feel like no one hardly reads that. So. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. It's amazing what you wrote as well too. When I looked at it, it's like step towards loving yourself. Midterms, a brief thought from the recovering evangelical POC using male privilege. Welcome to the yeah. choir. And I think you just have some really special messages that you have out there. It's not just music. It's what you write about as well too. And besides writing Thank a you. blog in your um, website as well too, uh, were you asked by any uh, newspaper uh, publishers or or websites, or blogs, or anything um, to, to write blogs for them? Uh, there have been a couple. So, you know, growing up where I was uh, in the middle of Ames, Iowa, I, I have written a couple of op-ed articles. I've written also for um, Medium, which is just a self-publication. It, it, it's a platform that allows you to be able to kind of write whatever you want and be able to get the word out. It's It's really great for... Um, not just amateur writers, but people who are just writers full-time professionally. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy Medium. But I, I wrote an article a few years ago, and it, it has a pretty, I would say, provocative title, but that was the idea. Uh, the title of it what is what white people should, or what white people can do about systemic racism. And it was actually published in the Des Moines Register, which actually has a huge readership. I didn't find it out until I, I published the article and then oh, wow. people from all over the planet replying to me, which was really cool. I'm again, I'm one of those people that seeks to engage, but I mean, the, the message of the article is really simple. Uh, it, it's just all about having conversations with people. And the, the reason I wrote the article was because, you know, it was just before Trump was elected president and I had all, all of my friends back home were, were messaging me that I had grown up with. And they were all asking me the same question. And it was, what can I do to, to help fix this situation? Which, I mean, if anything, it was on at least my friends' minds as far as like, man, am I, they, they were really began asking themselves this question. Am I, in my passivity, like allowing 
things like this to happen. And I don't even know necessarily what the context of it was that they were thinking, but I was getting asked this question by so many people. I was like, I'm just going to write an article about it. And then when I wrote an article about it, I was like, well, now I have this article. And I, so I shopped it around and the Des Moines Register wanted to pick it up and publish it. And they gave it a whole page, wow. which was not something. Yeah, they gave it a whole page because I, it wasn't short. As you can tell, I'm long winded. And so <laughs> it, it, was super, it was super fun to get to write. And I will say I, I didn't get, I mean, there were lots of people that were, I think, being really negative on the article on the website. But everyone that wrote me, there were lots of people that disagreed with points that I had to make, but no one disagreed with the point that we, we can do better. That, that was the fascinating thing to me is that even people that were upset or felt defensive about the message, which was, you know, there's a problem and we can fix it. Even those people found themselves saying, how, okay, then, then how can I help? Which was mind opening and mind blowing. I, I think I have a huge advantage of being on sort of the vanguard in my, in my personal life as far as m literally m meeting people face to face and toe to toe who I think before we would meet would call me, they would call themselves my enemy. I don't think of them as an enemy, but mm -hmm. I think they would think of themselves that way just because the thing that I seek and the places that I press into are absolutely all of the language and rhetoric that people associate with quote unquote snowflakes. Mm -hmm. And so the, the thing about it is that, again, and maybe it's just because I'm I'm disarming and tall, but uh, no one's ever been upset to my face. So, uh, yeah, it, it was super exciting to write that article. And, and I had people writing to me from Germany, France, wow. uh, Africa, from from Japan, all of these people that are paying attention. I mean, the, the 2016 election really, you know, put the United States in a big way on the map. And so people were seeking all of these conversations and. I got to, in my own small way, be a part of it. So, mm -hmm. But so, yeah, so I, I have gotten to publish some. So it sounds like a lot of the conversations didn't exist for a while because they're afraid of being scorned or prosecuted or, yeah. you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to think or say, what's what's that one term? Being um, alienated and everything alienated. else. Ostracized. Yes. Oh, ostracized. Oh, ostracized. Okay. Oh, yeah. Boy, yeah. I... I <laughs> Well, thanks to you, I got to pull up my dust off my thesaurus. It's like this is just great. I can have you on as well too. We can talk um, more about this as well too, along with your music. And of course, oh, yeah. it, it made me think of uh, Kennedy back in the day. It's basically where he just said, "It's not what your country can do for you; it's what you can do for your country." That's what it sounds like in, in a sense where you're coming from. Oh, for sure. You know, and I, I would agree that there. <laughs> There was there is a lot of defensiveness and a lot of fear around bringing up these conversations and seeming insensitive. And the great thing about being me is that it's hard to offend me, mostly because I'm clear, I'm very good natured just in general. So I, I'm more likely to laugh and again, investigate. I, I don't seek to condemn anyone. I don't like being condemned. And that is not the kind of energy I try to bring into any conversation or space that I'm playing or performing or existing in. And so you're absolutely right. It, it's the kind of thing that I think a lot of people are anxious about. And I'd love to come on your show and talk about it. It's it's definitely something that's clearly I'm very passionate about. I, I I, I'm of the school of there. It, there is no dumb questions. So, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly. The only the only dumb question is you ask is, is the question that you don't ask. Oh, one hundred percent agree. Absolutely, that's pretty much it too. And of course, you, and of course, you you talk about the thing about uh, racism, how that's a big problem, and everything else. If Martin Luther King were to walk on this planet today, what would he say right now? Oh, I was actually thinking about this recently uh, because he would still be alive, you know, if he hadn't been assassinated. He's he was born the same year as Betty White. And so, <laughs> Sliced uh, bread, the best thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Not, not just Betty White. He was also uh, born the same year as Anne Frank. So it, it, that's a little bit mind blowing is that they all would still be alive. Um, and so. You know, I, I think about this a lot. And the reason I think about this a lot is because, you know, as someone who wants to continue a legacy of, of nonviolence, of of having conversations, of pressing into those places where people aren't being treated with human decency, I think about it a lot. Not not because, you know, he's like a, an idol so much as like I, I think he's someone that did good because I definitely think 
that there is something also to be gained from from thinking about it in less friendly terms, even though I'm not personally like in that school of thought, you know, myself. And so I think with Dr. King, his point would be getting back to the foundation of what it is that connects and unites us. I really think that's why he was really of the leaders in the civil rights movement, some one of the most palatable leaders to all races, it was because he sought to find the common ground. And it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always pretty. I mean, I, reading more and more information that comes out about Dr. King, just because, you know, they, 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 they needed him to be what he was at the time that he was because the, the movement needed a leader and it needed certain things from Dr. King, and ultimately, you know, he was killed for it. But mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the thing that he would say is, is what is the thing that connects all of us? Why, why do we think that it, there is only success for one group of people? That, that my success means your failure. Because we don't have to define success as, as domination, or, or anything. We can, we can define it as something really simple, which is, again, being debated, such as a living wage or not having to worry about, you know, your health needs or even just people in a group not, not being afraid if you deal with anxiety or depression to be able to tell people <laughs> without fear of judgment, like, I am really having a dark day today. I just, I need a moment to myself. Mm. You know, we, we, we don't even have spaces like that for the most part. There are spaces like that out there with people, but I, I definitely, I was talking to a friend the other day that's like, I don't feel comfortable letting my employer know this about me mm -hmm. because I'm afraid that <laughs> of all these, these stigmas around mental health still. And so I, I think Dr. King would say, what, what is it that we have that makes us all people? Mm -hmm. And let's get back to that. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's a great message. I'd like to have you uh, back on as well, too, in 2020. Talk more about that. And speaking of 2020, oh, yeah. um, what, what, what's, your, what's your upcoming projects for 2020? Do you have another album coming out and any plans for an upcoming tour? Oh, yeah. Uh, so 2020, I'm hoping, is the year for a couple of different things. I'm finally dropping my Build It Up EP. Um, so I have another four songs written that are actually in currently in production that I'll be putting on that EP. I hope that's going to be in the first quarter of 2020, but I also hope that it's going to be the year of festivals. That's kind of really what I'm angling for. So if you have a festival out there, call me up. I want to be on the road. The great thing about being a solo artist is that, you know, literally I tour, it's just me in a car and I drive everywhere. <laughs> so, so I keep overhead low. I, you know, I'm able to crash in people's houses. I'm very much like a, a vagabond hippie that way. It doesn't uh -huh. cost much, but I, it's it's very easy to get me around. But I really want to be um, on the festival circuit. I definitely think that uh, my uplifting, fully produced act, you know, uh, is is a really great addition for a, a lot of different spaces. And I, I think my message is one that people want to be getting out there, frankly. You know, who who... Because I, I talk just enough realness for you to know that I'm serious, but then also enough good feelings for you to go, okay, I feel better about my day. <laughs> 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 but so festivals, I, I fully intend on hitting a lot of the places that I hit this last year. I, I toured for over 100 days, um, not contiguously, but um, I was over 100 days on the road and uh, I, I went all the way as no far north as Canada, as far east as Philly. As far south, I think, as uh, Albuquerque, um, and as far west as, obviously, L.A. So I was getting all over the place, um, and I hope to continue that. But, yeah, that, that's the, that's what I have planned for 2020. Obviously, more more new music, more... Uh, I want to also release some videos. That'd be, that'd be great. Looking forward to that, having you on in 2020. Awesome. And what do you consider Thanks, most defining moment in your career? Uh, the most defining moment, you know... Uh, that's a huge question and one I haven't thought about yet. I, let's let's narrow it down. My most defining moment for Reverend Doctor. Um, with Reverend Doctor this last year, my show out in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it was one of my least attended shows. And wow. I, the reason why I'm going to pick this show is because of what happened there. Something happened that I did not anticipate happening. So I went out there 
just two weeks after the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. It, 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 I was playing at a small college just outside of Pittsburgh, about an hour and a half. And I went there. There weren't a lot of students. The, the, it was in the wintertime. I ended up playing for about a group of 11 people. And the, the person that organized it was so sweet and apologetic, just as far as the attendance. But the, the other 10 people that were there were her friends. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so, and so it, nothing went right. It, it was the, the sound kept cutting out. Um, it was just a, a, a weird fiasco of a show. And honestly, if if I was probably in a different space, I might not have handled it so well. Just because, you know, you're on the road, it can get stressful. Mm-hmm. But in that moment, I was just, I was genuinely curious because I knew what that was like for me going through what I went through as far as the way mass shootings can interrupt a person's life. And, and, and just about anybody's life in Pittsburgh, too. When just, I, when, when I yeah. uh, saw that in, and I was a working a chef, I went, why in the name of God would right. somebody do this? And I said, a synagogue shooting, to me, that was chicken bleep. Right. 100%. Yeah. Well, well so I, I was d- out there. Go ahead. The only thing I could say about that, too, is if you were trying to get in Pittsburgh, maybe maybe have better circumstances, but it was just a case of bad timing and nothing you can do about it. That's like, wow. Oh, no. The great. So th- this is th- that's what I was going to get to. Like, okay. I-, I wasn't bummed out about the show. The, this, the defining moment for me is that with the sound had cut out. There's 10 people there. I know that they're all friends. And so I decided to go off book. I ended up sitting on the edge of the stage. We had a conversation about how they were feeling, about how their school was feeling. You know, I asked them questions like, how, how are you? You know, the, the, the expression from the students was incredible. What they told me was how upset they, they were so upset. The reason they were upset was because the only thing they wanted to do was to show solidarity to this community, mm-hmm. to let people know that they they were heartbroken and that they stood by the victims of these families and, and that, that they were, they, they, and they had no way to like express these feelings, this grief, this, this emotion. And so what we ended up doing was putting our arms around each other. And I, I played uh, that Bill Withers song, Lean On Me. We mm-hmm. shouted it at the top of our lungs, you know, because it was really a moment of connection and togetherness. And, and not only that, but I ha- I've been writing a song called Better Together. I taught them the words to that song, and I, I ended up teaching it to another girl there who was a vocalist, and we kind of sang a duet together. But we, we sang four or five songs just on the edge of the stage, kind of like in a small circle, and we talked. You know, that was one of the best moments for me with Reverend Doctor because it showed me that, you know, it's it, like I could certainly have had a musical performance or been like, mm, the sound and lights are not working according to what I want. But ultimately, the, the thing that I'm doing is a little bit different. It's about connecting with people. And it showed me that the most important thing is to, to listen. The strange thing about being an artist, artist and being on stage for me is, is listening to my audience and, and trying to feel what they're feeling. So. Mm-hmm. That, that was one of the most powerful moments of my life, honestly. And, of course, it's very important for artists to get a get a feel to vibe what's going on uh, with the audience as well, too. And face right. one and reading as well, too. A lot of artists don't get those vibes or they don't care to. You know, that's something that, that needs to be brought up. It's like the artist needs to feel what the audience yeah. is feeling, <laughs> not just take the money and run and um, go party and everything else. Like, you see it read a lot of people, but they need to feel it and need to bring it back again. That's just a great story. i got to say that. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, hey, no it, was, it was it was a touching it was a touching moment. It's not something that I'll ever forget. Hopefully, you know, um, hopefully I see them again. Hopefully mm-hmm. they bring me back out and we get to talk about what it was that happened, man. Oh, I'll tell you what. So, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, OK. And also, who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Oh, ooh, I have so many, so many. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to leave it with let's can can I do I'm going to do three. Go ahead. The first one, like I said, is is Bill Withers. For me, almost no one knows this cat's name. But the thing about Bill Withers is that we teach his songs to children still. Everyone knows the words to Ain't No Sunshine and Lean On Me. Mm-hmm. And, and it's one of those things where even if you don't know his name, people feel a thing from his music. Grandma's hands. People 
have an association with it and it's it's never a bad thing they're not like oh turn turn off lean on me like no <laughs> no, no one has had that feeling in the history of the world uh but so bill withers and not, another reason is that as a, as a black acoustic guitarist you know I, i've been in my i suppose maturity of my craft been looking to people whose careers and messages and styles i've been you know, using as a guide, and he's one of those people I keep coming back to. That's the first one, Bill Withers. Uh, the the second one, I would have to say, is um, oh man, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, he sings that song, Freedom. Uh, Richie Havens. Richie Havens. Yes, that's right. I yes. remember that. Yeah. So with Richie Havens, another uh, black acoustic guitarist, but you know, he is one of these people. Whereas a folk and roots musician. Did, did exactly what um, it, I, I was trying to do with that show. He's definitely an artist that was known for listening and talking to his audiences, of interacting with them, of being present and in the moment while on stage. I think that that is a true mark of an entertainer, capital E. And I, it's he, again, as someone whose uh, career I am trying to emulate. And I suppose the third biggest influence for me lately has been Stevie Wonder. Uh, tied between Stevie Wonder, Wonder and Anderson Pack. I don't know if you know who Anderson Pack is, but with Stevie, Stevie's one of these people that kind of like defined the uh, the project album, the uh, the idea of a record label, just like being like, here's our arsenal of money, kind of do whatever you want with it. And it's because he was a genius at what he did. He broke so many boundaries and barriers with his music and was such uh, just a, a, a musical genius. I was fortunate enough. I, I saw him actually when I was living in Minneapolis. Prince had just passed. Um, they had his memorial concert at um, uh, the St. Paul Auditorium and got to see him. And he sang Purple Rain with a recorded version, a live version of Prince singing it. And, you know, while that wasn't me on stage, as far as musical moments, that's one of the most profound moments that I've had in my life as a musician or otherwise. And it, it moved me and getting to be there for that. I, I will never forget. That is amazing too. And lastly, yeah, what's the best advice and give the anybody at this point? At this point, when they're trying to be a musician, um, it can be that, or it can be whatever's on your mind. Oh, great. Uh, love yourself, man. You know, there, there's, there's too many ways that we're all different. And I believe that being a good person, being a positive effect on others, begins with you loving the rough, weird edges that all of us possess. There's not a single person that, you know, is, is perfect in this life. And it's far too short to be thinking about how you look Instead, love the way you that you look, that you are, the, the weird things you say and do, like press into those things. Those are the things that I think make each of us wonderful. That is amazing, too. And Keith Rollins, Reverend Doctor, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much Thanks, for your man. time. Looking forward to having you in soon. And before we go here, tell us about your upcoming projects, your website. How do people contact you? Where can people purchase your music? Absolutely. ReverendDrMusic.com, my website, is a, is a great connection, like you were saying. That's where I keep all of my most recent shows. But as far as social media, Instagram, at underscore Reverend Doctor, I keep that up to date pretty frequently. I'm on there. I mean, as a musician, it's almost impossible to avoid. Same thing with Facebook, Facebook.com forward slash R-E-V-D-R, Reverend Doctor. Uh, if you, you know, search that, you'll find it. Um, like I said, hoping to drop this EP early 2020. I am on Twitter. I believe it's at Revdar, you know, R E V D R once again. But honestly, the, the best ways to keep in touch with me are Instagram and Facebook and my website. Those are probably the top three. But yeah, I'm looking forward to 2020. Fantastic. And just want to say, Reverend Doctor, you made us feel good. I'm canceling all awesome. my doctor appointments. Thank you very much for your time, Keith Rollins. <laughs> You've been fantastic. Love to have you Thanks on again soon. Me, and um, keep us up to date. I'm definitely looking forward to having you on again soon. Please do that, Mike. I'm so Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you, man. I, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. 
Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and the MikeWagnerShow.com. Please support our program with your donations at the MikeWagnerShow.com. Join us again next time for another great episode of the Mike Wagner Show.